I'd like to welcome Nick to come and talk about PCB design. Uh, I know a lot of you are in Capstone or in grad school who you need to like, you know, design a PCB for all your stuff. So hopefully we'll have a great talk to kind of give you guys all the know-hows about how to design a PCB. I'll pass the stage off to him. Hello. Yes, so I am Nicholas Bergman. Um, I was a, I am a graduate of U of T. Uh, I graduated in 2010, and ever since then, and even before I graduated, I was doing PCB design. I've done a lot of high-speed PCB design, I've done a lot of very simple PCB design, uh, I've done a variety. Um, that being said, I, I'm, not the, I'm not an expert, I'm not the, the only one who knows about PCB design in the world, I'm not um, the only one that you can ask questions to. There is a lot. The premise of this uh, presentation is to kind of go over the process, the design process of making a PCB. Even from before you even make a PCB, you got to make a schematic. So that's the goal of the, the presentation, is to walk through all those steps. Um, and then get towards the end, get a bit more technical on the PCB stuff. Uh, and then really, it's open for any questions that you guys might have. Uh, can I get a show of hands who's, who's designed a PCB before? Tried to? Has anyone made a schematic in software as well? Cool. Uh, who's second year or under? Okay, who's graduate level? And then the rest are in between. So, uh, as I mentioned before, this is kind of a, an overview. For some, it might not be technical enough. For others, it might be just enough. If you have any questions, stop me at any time. Uh, that's the purpose of this. I'm, again, uh, ask me questions because I'm not here for any other reason than for you guys to, to learn something extra from what you learned in school. So as, a, as an overview, uh, let's talk first about whether you need a PCB. So there are a lot of instances where people just want to make a PCB. That's fine. But there are also a lot of instances where people don't know that they can get away without making a PCB. So we'll kind of step through that. Then we'll move on to PCB design. We'll walk through all the steps uh, from schematic generation, from component selection, to generating the schematic, to generating the netlist, to moving on to the PCB layout, mechanical review, all of those steps, and then generating the manufacturing files. Um, at the end of it, if we have some time, I'll, I'll show you guys uh, some schematic design as well as some PCB layout. Uh, I'll, I'll look at the tools that I use primarily, which is ORCAD or, or PCB editor. So to start, do you need a PCB? So if I wanted to use uh, an Atmel Atmega 328 chip, do I need to make a PCB? I'm only, uh, my goal is to control eight LEDs, that's it, just toggle them on and off. Do I need to make a PCB? Can I get away with something that already exists? You definitely don't need to make a PCB for something that simple. You can use just an Arduino, uh, the one picture here is an Arduino Uno, uh, very, very readily available, 30 bucks. No need to do PCB design, no need to make any risky, costly endeavors. Just go buy a $30 device. So what the Arduino Uno is really is just a reference design. It's or a demo board. There's tons of different names for it. But the idea is that this is a pre-made circuit that's available for purchase um, that you can go and, and use that specific Atmel controller. So that Atmel controller is fanned out. All the pins are already provided to you. Easy to access, easy to program. So, as an example, recently I was doing a, a design that required um, that required going from 110 volts, uh, actually 220 to 110 volts, down to 12 volts DC. So I looked and looked and looked, found a couple of different circuit ideas. Yeah, I could go, I could prototype, go to Digi-T, buy a bunch of parts, assemble it all together, see what happens. Uh, but then I found a component provided by NXP, great manufacturer, produced great parts. Uh, it's a TEA-1721, and I thought, oh, that's great, but this, this component is an SOIC 8-pin, so it's a surface mount component, not very easy to use, not very easy to prototype with, so, hmm, well, if we did a little bit of searching, did a little bit of digging, and it actually didn't take much at all, it was on the product page, they have a link directly to what I wanted, so it was a transformer list reference design, so it was this guy, 
So within, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, I was able to find the chip that I wanted to use, and I was able to buy the reference board. In two days, I had it in my hands, prototyped it, tested it, found out that it would, that it would work for my situation, and then, and only then, did I start to move towards uh, designing my own custom PCB. So the benefit of this is it took out a huge amount of risk. I knew already from the manufacturer that this chip will work, it'll do what I want. They have a circuit that does exactly what I want with that chip. The other benefit too is that with reference designs, um, reference designs are great because manufacturers provide a ton of information on reference designs. The goal of a reference design for a manufacturer is to convince you to buy that chip in volume. If all I had to do was buy this $100 device and then convince myself that, oh, this is a great chip, I'm, the board that I designed for this is going to go, or we're going to produce probably 100,000 boards. So right there, at a chip cost of a, of a dollar, it made a good amount of money. And all they had to do was provide this to me. So e even if you're lucky, too, reference designs could come for free. If I knew someone at NXP directly, if I didn't want to, I don't like talking to salespeople, but if I wanted to talk to a salesperson, they probably would have given it to me for free for the same idea that they want to convince me to use the chip. So this is great. This is perfect. Other, other reference designs, I mean, these are ones that you guys might be familiar with. Uh, there's an Arduino Uno. There's, can anyone tell me what the one in the middle is? OK, well, this is the easy one. Can you tell me what this one is? All right, can you tell me what this one is? People can plug. There you go. So all these are reference designs. This one's funny because it's actually not a reference design by Atmel. It was done by a bunch of dudes in Italy who thought, hey, let's make this very easy for people to use Atmel controllers. The BeagleBone Black, that's from TI, and they poured tons of money into this. They want you to use that chip because they really want to sell you that chip in volume. The Raspberry Pi, again, was not made by um, Broadcom. So Broadcom's a controller on there. It was actually made by a bunch of people wanting to create the cheapest development platform possible. I mean, this thing only costs 25, 35 bucks, depends on where you buy it from. But the goal of that was to get it into schools in India, into China, into any, anywhere that, that, I don't know, they, they needed a low cost development platform. That was the idea. And then it took off. People loved it. It has amazing functionality. It has HDMI output, audio, tons of features that you can do. Um, so it's a really, really good pro platform that is readily available. If I wanted to use that Broadcom chip, this chip in the middle, well, that'd be a real pain. It's a BGA package. The pins are on the bottom. I can't hand solder that. I don't think any of you can. Uh, you'd have to go, you'd have to make your own PCB, design it, <coughs> test it, do all sorts of stuff just to get to this platform, just to get to the point where you start developing. So reference designs can be really, really helpful, even if you're about to go and produce 100,000 of them. So this convinced me pretty quickly that it'll work. I don't really need to do any more work. Uh, I know from the manufacturer, they even provide waveforms and EMI testing data. So I know that it doesn't radiate a ton of emission from the board. I know that it will work for my situation. All for 100 bucks. So really, the reference design versus custom. So what are the trade-offs? As I mentioned earlier, reference designs are readily available. If you want an Arduino Uno, you can go down the street to a store called Creatron. You can buy it. I think he overprices them. I think they're like 40 bucks. But you can still get it that day. With a custom PCB, you have no chance of getting it in a day. You still have to design it. You still have to manufacture it. You still have to assemble it. Usually, the design time for a PCB is, depending on the time it takes for you to design it, the manufacturing alone is no less than two weeks. They could tell you it'll be a week, but it's no less than two weeks. So already you're out for, for weeks before you even get to start playing with your device. The other benefit, as I mentioned earlier, is that the hardware is already tested. So with respect to this NXP chip, I already know this board works. This layout works. The component selection is already done for me. I know it all works. That's great. When I do it myself, uh, for a case of a uh, power supply, it's very good to do simulation to make sure your capacitors are the right size, your resistors are the right sizes, all sorts of simulation, all sorts of testing. All of that you still have to do yourself with a custom PCB. Cost also, cost is cheap for a reference design, cost is very expensive for a custom PCB. But there are trade-offs. So if I wanted to use the Uno, 
But if I wanted it to be half the size, I can't go and cut the Uno in half and hope that it'll still work. I'm very size constrained. So same with if I want all those pins fanned out, or if I don't want them all fanned out, or if I don't want to use them all. You're very, very constrained through a reference design. So it really only holds value when you're doing a one-off, when you're doing even just a, a few pieces, or if you just want to prototype and test before you go and you make a large volume purchase. With a custom PCB, you can make it any shape, any size. You can make it kind of this round, weird shape. You can make it this kind of like, I don't even know what that would be called. But you can make it any shape that you want. There's no constraint on it. So really it comes down to whether or not you need a PCB for your design. If you had a circuit like this, you really should get your PCB. You should really do that even from a reliability standpoint. That's a nightmare. If I go, if this is one of your circuits, especially in the design fair, if, if you guys are in your fourth year design fair, you have a circuit like this, and your professor comes up and he pulls out this wire, what happens? I mean, your whole circuit failed, whole design presentation failed, it's all for nothing. You'll probably have a really hard time finding which wire actually pulled out. So, in a case like this, probably not a bad idea to start looking at making your own PCB. Does anybody have any questions so far? So, with respect to PCB design, there's just some general guidelines. This is just what you have to do to make your own PCB. These are steps that everyone has to do. You can't avoid them, you can't skip them. You gotta start with component selection. You gotta pick out what IC you wanna use. If you were the guys at Arduino and they said, oh, let's use the Atmel, whatever, Atmega 328, that's a decision that they made. They made the component selection choice. From that, they need to make a schematic. They need to provide a document that shows all of the connections from that Atmega to capacitors, to resistors, to connectors. They have to, that's the idea of the schematic. It's a document that highlights the connections between components. After that, there's the footprint development. So before you can even go and start to doing your PCB layout, you need to somehow tell the computer that my little box symbol in my schematic represents this capacitor, or that resistor, or that connector. So you have to create a PCB footprint. This is a file that defines the shape, the pins, the locations, all of that. So we'll get into that a little bit later. After you have those components, you have a schematic and you have the footprint files, you can then generate a netlist, then you can generate your PCB layout. So your netlist is basically taking a computer language or whichever the software that you're using, it basically takes the schematic away from it being pretty, it just makes a text file that says pin, pin one of U1 connects to pin two of U2. So that's the idea of the netlist, it's just a document that defines the connections. Then you're going to do PCB placement. Preferably you do mechanical review as well. And in most cases, a PCB is going into a box, an enclosure, um, some sort of device. There's going to be constraints on where components can be located, on where your mounting holes need to be, on all sorts of kind of mechanical constraints to it. So it's, it's good to do a review here before you've done any of the layout. You don't want to get too far and be told, oh, you've got to move that chip half a millimeter and then you got to redo everything. Then you move on to the PCB layout, that's kind of the easy part, the placement's already done, all the components are in place, just kind of connect the dots. Then you can generate the manufacturing files and then send it out to actually be manufactured. So these are the major steps, can't avoid them, have to do them, uh, and so we're going to kind of step through each one of them. To start though, uh, the design software for making PCBs and doing schematics, there is a lot of different options. So, if you have a lot of money, most people don't, but companies do, you can get really, really nice software. So, some of the really nice software, Altium Designer, uh, it has very, very good 3D design support. So, what I'm saying is actually all this software does the same thing. The free stuff, it'll do the same as the professional stuff. But, the free stuff is definitely not as good to use as Altium Designer. Where you're, what you're paying your money for is all the little perks, all the little features, all the little fun things. So, Altium Designer uh, is very, very good for 3D design. You can see when you place a capacitor, you can see the shape of it, you can see the overall geometry, it's not just a little box. It actually comes up as a capacitor of a certain height, a certain diameter, all sorts of stuff. The issue with Altium is that it costs $8,000 for a single license per year. So that's a ridiculous number, especially for a student. Um, with respect to Cadence or CAD, um, 
You guys actually might be familiar with, with uh, Cadence, uh, PSPICE simulations. Some of the software used at U of T has PSPICE uh, for Cadence. Really, really good tool for simulation as well as also for, for PCB design. Then you get into the free stuff. And so, although it is free, the one benefit of it being free is that usually there's a very big community around it. Um, just like how the, the Arduino Uno took off, and just like how you can go online, you can download code to do almost anything, you can do something similar with the free software that's available. You can go out there and you can download free libraries that have all the PCB footprints for kind of generic components, uh, even some specialty items. It's very, very convenient in that respect. The professional software, you might get lucky, and the manufacturer might provide you PCB footprint files or schematic information, but that's pretty rare. That's, that's not very common. With the free stuff, there's a lot of communities out there. Uh, PCAD is one that's pretty up and coming. Uh, has a very good community around it. I've never used it myself, but it actually looks like a pretty good tool. Eagle is something that um, I think every U of T student should, should uh, at least be aware that there are full licenses available. So Eagle comes in a couple distributions. It comes in the free one, which kind of uh, provides some design constraints. It, it limits you to a two-layer board. It limits you to a certain board of a certain size. I think it's three inches by four inches, something like that. But U of T has already bought licenses for the unlimited version. Um, and they're already available. They're just waiting for you to use down the design center. Um, they have to be tied to those computers, so you can only use them there. But it gives you access to doing an unlimited amount of layers, unlimited amount of components, unlimited size. So you can do anything that you want with that, that, uh, those licenses that are available to you. Uh, some other interesting things is a lot of manufacturers, and even uh, DigiKey, which DigiKey is not a manufacturer, they just happen to be a massive distributor of components. Massive distributor. If I wanted a capacitor or a connector on this board, typically I can go onto DigiKey, I can find the component, I can order it, and as long as I order it by 6 p.m., I will get it next day before noon. So that's just how massive DigiKey is. They have, all, they have thousands of components. It's a fantastic website. Get very, get very familiar with it. Um, but on November 6, actually, they just released some free PCB software. Uh, that's actually partnered with, with, I think, I think they're partnered with Eagle. But it just goes to show that almost everybody wants you to use their software. They want to give you access to software. Because of course, if you use DigiKey software, it's going to link to all sorts of DigiKey components. Same goes with, uh, I think Mouser has the same. Um, RS Electronics, all these big distributors, they actually have software that's available to you um, that's, that's pretty decent, but it also kind of cons you into using them as a distributor. Not a problem if you're only making one off board. So, any questions with respect to design software? All right. So, let's get started with, with respect to PCB design. So, a good place to start is obviously component selection. You're not going to design a board without knowing what you want to put on that board. You have to have an idea or a circuit idea, an understanding of what you're about to go and produce. Um, whether or not you want to produce a power circuit, whether you want to produce something that takes AC voltage down to DC voltage. Uh, this board here was actually came out of a tablet. So this has almost all the functionality of a regular tablet. Camera, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all sorts of stuff. Um, or you can go and you can do something simple. Or you can produce something, this board is just an electronic lock. So it has a keypad on the front, drives a motor, turns on some LEDs, fairly basic. But the idea is I still understand the functionality of that circuit. So the idea is to just get started with, with uh, understanding what the circuit's going to be, start with a block diagram, draw it on a whiteboard, on a chalkboard, on a piece of paper, on a piece of scrap paper, whatever you want. Put the idea down, understand what the components, what the major components are going to be. So for instance, if I have a microcontroller, what other components am I going to need for, to support that microcontroller? Can anybody guess? Microcontrollers typically run off 3.3, 5 volts. How do I generate that 5 volts? What do I need? Regulator. Exactly. So you need something to do some sort of power generation or, or stepping it down to a voltage that you can use. So if you're plugging it into a wall, if you're plugging it into even just a, a power supply, a DC power supply, you still probably want to regulate that voltage and control it and use it the way that you want to use it. So even though I've picked a microcontroller, say the Atmel for the Arduino Uno, I still need to pick other components that are around it. Um, 
when you're doing a kind of component selection and block diagrams, don't think about passives, don't think about capacitors or resistors, all this stuff. Yeah, you need it all, but you really don't need to draw it into a block diagram. That's that comes with the territory when you put a when you put a component down. So from this you get a kind of a rough build material. Especially if you're in industry, especially if you're moving forward with the PCB design, cost is going to be very, very, very important. So the cost of this power board, can anybody guess how much this, this board costs in volume? On it, there's maybe about 20 components. 50 cents? Yeah. Anybody else? This only cost $1.50. Board, assembly, components, for 10,000 pieces, $1.50. So if we're producing 100,000 of them, I don't want to pay for a component that is an extra 50 cents more expensive than if I can make it 50 cents cheaper. So at this point, with component selection, the idea is you can generate a rough build materials and you can check. You can make sure that you're not picking a component that uh, maybe, for instance, you just can't get. Maybe the lead time for the component is eight weeks. Very common, very, very common with ICs is that you pick a component that is not readily available, it's not in stock at DigiKey, and it takes eight weeks to be manufactured. That's a real, real, real pain. Um, but from this, at least with your component selection, before you start doing design work, before you start making a schematic, before you start doing a PCB layout, you at least know, yeah, okay, I can get them, they're readily available, they cost a dollar, blah, blah, blah. So that's a good kind of place to start. Make sure that your design is within uh, realistic expectations. You can, uh, when you get into industry as well, you're also going to have requirements documents. There's going to be specifications that are provided from your boss, from your customer, from whoever. There are going to be requirements that your board has to fulfill. So if you're creating a custom board, uh, let's take an example of the Arduino Uno. Now the purpose of it is to fan out all the components to create basically a reference design. You want to create a design that can be used by anybody to do anything with that controller. So that's a design constraint. What does that mean? It means you've got to bring out all the pins. All the pins have to be accessible. They have to be easy to use, easy to connect to. So all these are going to be covered in some sort of specification document. And they're really going to be uh, a good uh, check and balance system. So you've picked your controller. Well, does a controller meet the specifications that you're asking for? What if I wanted to have uh, HDMI output from an Arduino Uno? Is that possible? Can I get HDMI output from uh, Arduino Uno? No. It's a horrible 8-bit processor. It's horrible. But it's great for turning on LEDs, for toggling switches, for very, very basic, very simple things to do. So uh, that right there, I would have already known I can't pick an Atmel at Mega 328. So it's, at this point, it's kind of a check and balance. The other thing that's very convenient is to generate a, a power bomb. So uh, with the case of the 5 microcontroller, um, typically they draw about 100 milliamps. But if I am controlling a motor driver with that microcontroller, well, the question is, how big is that motor? What am I switching? Am I switching a 1 amp motor? Am I switching a 400 volt, 20 amp, huge, massive motor? All these are provided in the design specifications, but all these will then become very important for you to determine power requirements that are required on your, on your, uh, in your schematic, as well as just in general, in your block diagram. It's very helpful. So here's an example of a block diagram that I spent way too much time on. Um, was not even useful, but uh, it at least shows the representation of all the components that are in the circuit. So this block diagram here is actually used for this circuit. So I did this because I thought it would be useful to put in, in, uh, in Visio. It really wasn't. Nobody cared. But it was very helpful for me. I could have drawn it on a piece of paper. It would have been just as useful. Um, but now I get to show you and all of this pretty glory. At the center, I started with a, picking a microcontroller. It's a PIC, very basic controller, 8-bit microprocessor. The function of this is just an electronic lock. I'm going to type in a password, and I'm going to turn on a motor. It's going to count a certain amount of revolutions, and I'm going to turn the motor off. After that, I'm going to sound a little buzzer. It's going to say beep, beep, whatever. And then it's going to turn on an LED. So that's the purpose of this whole circuit. Very, very simple, very, very basic. So I start with the controller. Then I actually started in this case with, uh, with looking at the power. We wanted to charge a battery. It's a lithium ion battery in an electronic lock. We wanted to charge it over USB, so I need to understand what are my charging characteristics of a battery. 
what, uh, what's my charging voltage that I'm going to have present. Um, that just happens to be the 5 volts from a USB. Then I can pick certain parts. On this diagram, you can see certain part numbers. Um, there is for the USB charger, uh, microchip part, MCP, blah, 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 blah. Um, all that is very helpful to have at this point. Um, it goes to say that I picked all the components. At this point, I picked a real-time clock, a flash chip for, for memory, for data storage, uh, as well as the actual 3.3 volt regulator. Yep. Will you pick the packages or the, the package that you would use at this point, or would that come later? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So, um, what's happening in the industry is almost everybody's moving to service mount components. Nobody has through hole anymore, uh, and there is there's a really big uh, design constraint when you pick a component. Usually, they don't offer it in a variety of different parts. So you, maybe they offer it in one or two different packages. That's about it. So. Uh, this is where uh, knowing the, your size constraint of your board and your, how much space you actually have will be useful. Um, at this point, I picked a regulator that came in a variety of different packages. Same with the, the, the PIC. It came in a variety of different packages. It came in a variety of different pin numbers as well. So the same device, I could get in a 28 pin, 44 pin, or 64 pin. So um, right off the bat, I had options at least to, to change the design if I needed or expand, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, at this point, it's not bad to be thinking about package sizes, to be thinking about what's readily available, but at least with this, I can go and I can check DigiKey for the major components and make sure that this thing doesn't cost $800, make sure that's not going to take eight weeks to manufacture, that type of thing. That's, that's the purpose of this. It also really helps you check, go back to the requirements stuff here. It's something you guys probably learned in first year that kind of tried to hammer over your head. You have to do, do specification documents, the whole shall, would, all that, all that crap. It, it is a whole bunch of fluff in first year, but it's also very important when you get to industry. If you need to have a buzzer, that's great. It's going to make a sound, but a buzzer makes a sound at a certain frequency. So that information can be very, very important. I'm not designing this for me. I'm not designing it for fun. I'm designing it for a customer. So that customer wants this buzzer to sound a certain way, and therefore they want it to be at a certain frequency. This one happens to be at about 2,700 hertz. So that was in the requirements document. That was specified by the customer specifically. They heard something before, it sounded great, that's what they wanted to continue with. So this kind of goes to, to what you mentioned about packages. Um, through hole versus surface mount, it's a through hole is uh, something that's that was very popular obviously when packages started coming out. It's the only way that they could manufacture boards, but then they moved into surface mount components. So the one up here, this is a dip package. This actually goes through the board. So very useful for prototyping with, uh, with breadboards as well. Um, you can easily hand solder to it. You can easily prototype with it and put it in a breadboard, test out your circuit really quickly. But it's also really big. And the worst part is that I can't put a component on the underside of that PCB. I have pins sticking through my board to solder it from the underside. I can't put components around the pins. I have to have access for a soldering iron or for some sort of wave solder process, some sort of manufacturing process. So in most cases, uh, manufacturers are moving towards service mount components. So this is a, a T-SOP package, which actually has these little leads here. And they're little like J-type leads, or little, or not J-type actually, that's a different one. But they're little kind of gull wing leads that kind of stick out, and they solder the pads on the, on the top or the bottom layer of the board. But the benefit is I don't have to worry about the other side of it. I can put this on the top, and I, I don't have to worry about anything on the bottom. I don't have to make any clearances for it. I don't have to make any accommodations for it. Plus, then I don't have to pay for assembly of the bottom of the board. So this particular board has a bunch of through-hole connectors. Fact of life, they're a lot more robust than a surface mount connector. But we decided not to put any single component on the bottom. So the reason for this particular board was just for cost. If I don't have to manufacture anything on the bottom of the board, that means that I don't have to put it through two processes. I don't have to manufacture this board twice. So if I have surface mount components on the top and on the bottom, uh, similar to how this board works. So there are resistors and caps and ICs on both the top and the bottom of this board, but that means that it has to go through an oven twice. It's cumbersome, it's annoying, that might be the design constraint that you have, but it also is more expensive. So you'll see in a little bit, I have a, I have a good example that actually um, from a lot of manufacturers, they try their best 
to move away from doing a two layer, uh, like a top and a bottom component um, PCB. If you can save cost any way that you can, that's, that's a great way to do it. So, as I kind of hinted at, it really, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't care what component that you pick, what package that you pick. Uh, it, it's all dependent on your design. Um, the space industry, anything that goes into space actually still uses through-hole components. The reason why is just surface mount uh, through-hole components are a lot more robust. You have a contact on the top of the board, and you have a contact on the bottom of the board. With the surface mount component, you only have contact at this small little lead. And when you're going up into space, if you're spending a billion dollars on a component, on a, a PCB, that's a part of a billion dollar spaceship or whatever that they're sending, satellite, you don't want this pin breaking and preventing your whole device from, stop, uh, from, from working. So they use, still today, uh, almost all through-hole components. And that's actually the, the primary reason why manufacturers still produce through-hole component uh, parts. It's all for the space industry. <coughs> Can anyone guess why this would break when you go up into space? It has something to do with thermal. Can anyone guess? So the material difference of a pin on a component is a lot different than the material of a PCB. So when you go up into space, you have a huge change in temperature. So when you have that big change in temperature, you have a change in the material property, change in the material size, thermal expansion, all sorts of stuff. This would crack. So as you go up into space, all of a sudden your board is now at minus 40, minus 80. It would just crack. Your component might fall right off. So there's a good reason why people still use through-hole components for space. So this is the example um, that I had. This is actually an Apple uh, iPad 2 PCB. Um, almost all of the components are placed on the top. There's also not a single through-hole component on the board. This means that I can put it through one single process, one single manufacturing process, put it through the oven once, it's done. That's it. The board's done. Ready to be used, slap it on an iPad, sell it for 500 bucks. This is the cheapest way that you can make a board. You can also notice that they don't even put silk screen. So when we get to it, silk screen on a PCB really uh, holds no value except for the person who's using the PCB. So if you're making a PCB for prototype, it's very convenient to be able to know uh, that device is U1, this resistor is R1. It's very convenient, very helpful. But when you're producing thousands and thousands of boards that are going into iPads, which are never going to be opened, which are never going to be debugged, if this board breaks, they're going to open the iPad and they're going to replace it with a brand new one. There's absolutely no value in paying for silkscreen. The cost of silkscreen per board is a couple cents. That just goes to show they want to make as much money as possible off that board. So now that we have the components, now we have a rough idea of what we're doing. We're going to start with schematic generation. So each component on the PCB is defined by a symbol within the schematic. So the symbol uh, has certain parameters, and these parameters define what is going to be called on when you get to the PCB. So these are very important, the reference. So when I go from my schematic to my PCB, I want to know that in my PCB, my reference for the capacitor 1, C1, I know which component that is in my PCB. Very, very helpful, very, very convenient, uh, as well as the PCB footprint. So this is the footprint name. This is the, the, the name that it references to a certain file to represent your symbol in, in whatever way, shape, or form it is. For a capacitor, this particular capacitor is a surface mount. It's a certain size. And I can access that through, the, through a file just in the library. Pins are also very important. You need to tell the software how many pins that there are in this device. Uh, that also has to match what is in your PCB footprint. The idea is that you want to have the same number of pins in your schematic as what you have on your footprint. The rest of the information, almost all of it, um, is just helpful information. It's very convenient as a, from a designer standpoint. So when I place a capacitor, I could put C1 down and in my memory, I could remember that this is a 0.1 microfarad cap. I can remember the manufacturer, I can remember the part number, but that would be very inconvenient. The other thing too is that from my schematic I can generate bill materials. Um, as I mentioned before, DigiKey is producing PCB design software. So the reason why they do that is because 
then all of this stuff would already be populated for you. And the big thing is, is that they would have the DigiKey part number in it. So they would provide you that DigiKey part number for whatever capacitor this is. And they do that because, well, that's great. You generated a bill of materials, and we can just import that right to DigiKey and ship it out to you next day. That's perfect. So all this, uh, most of this information is just there for, for you, for convenience. So uh, it's very helpful when you make a, a part or when you select a part that you kind of keep a library of it. You keep that, that symbol tied in a library somewhere that you can reference later on. So if I wanted to, to drop another 0.1 microfarad cap, it'd be very easy for me to go into my library and just say, oh, I already picked that. I can use it again. So once, we, uh, once we've sliced the component, defined and made it symbol, then we can start placing more parts into the uh, schematic. Here you have uh, additional components as a, a flash IC, there's a resistor, very basic. There's, uh, the next steps are connecting the, uh, the pins to, each, uh, to the designated spots. So all these pins are tied to this single pin of that resistor. These are all tied through, they're called nets. They're just the wire connections between one pin to another. Also in the software, it's very convenient, very helpful for critical nets. So this is not an important net. This will have a generic name that will be net 100. Not very useful when you go to the PCB layer and then you're looking between components and then you say, hmm, what, what was the purpose of this net? What was the purpose of this wire being connected to this resistor? Well, it's very helpful to, to then label your, your nets with a net name. So this is anything that you want to label it. Um, it just makes it more convenient for you to use. So when you go to the PCB layer, when you're then connecting from pin 5 to whichever other device in your schematic, well, now I know that this is a high-speed data line. This is a communication line. That's great. Now I know I can design my PCB um, so that there are certain requirements and design constraints associated with uh, those signals. So it's very, very convenient to do, especially when you get into high-speed design, especially when you get into high density and high components. The net names become fantastic. So if I had a DDR memory, DDR3 has something like 64 pins on it, on one package. All of those have address lines, so address 0 to address 15. It has data 0 to data 15. All of those nets, if they're not properly labeled, when I go into my PCB, they're just some random number. Net 100, 101, 108. It depends on whatever order that I connected them in the schematic. There's some arbitrary useless name. So if I label those though, I can also tie all those nets to certain design constraints. So when you're doing DDR memory, you need to have design constraints associated with them so that they travel a certain length, no more, no less. You have to length match them. So the wire connection between device one to device two has to be the same length, especially with high-speed data. You don't want one bit of that data getting there before the other bit gets there. So all of that is very, very important. And with the, the use of net names, you can do that. You can add all those design constraints. The next thing, the next quick thing is just kind of power and ground. These are symbols um, that can be also custom named if you have two different grounds in your circuit. Uh, also, if you have different power rails. Uh, they're very convenient because within a schematic, you just have to put this little symbol to any wire and it'll be tied to ground. Same goes with the power rail. You can change that from 3v3 to 1v8, to whatever you want. It doesn't matter, it's just a name, it's just a reference for you. So this particular board had three pages of schematics to it. This just happened to be one. This was just the controller, and it shows the majority of the connections within the circuit. You can see here, there's my buzzer, there's my flash chip, there's my real-time clock. So you can see all these connections. There's a USB connection as well. So all these came to fruition after the block diagram. So it's great. Next, before we go in, before we go into PCB that, we need to make, define all of those symbols, all those footprints for the components that are required or called for in the schematic. So a PCB footprint, as in this case, this happens to be, actually, does anybody know what, what this one is? Does anybody know what, what footprint this looks like? called an SOIC. So that just happens to be the, the kind of the <coughs> symbol, the, the package size that they use. Um, there are 
industry standards for almost everything with regards to PCB design. We'll touch on that a little bit later. But there are standard package sizes, and it's very convenient because if I make a symbol for an SOIC chip that's eight pins, well, that's great because now I can use it amongst a variety of different devices that also happen to be the same package size. So this symbol defines physically what my device looks like from my useless little block diagram here. So this useless little block happens to have all the pins that are associated with each one of these pins. They're numbered, so ground is pin four, happens to be this pin here. It makes it very convenient. This is the reference between your schematic and your PCB layout. So how do I know the orientation? So this, this, if I place it one way, if I rotate 180 degree, uh, degrees and place it down again, how do I know what the correct orientation is? How do I know where pin one is and where pin eight is? There's something on the symbol that shows it to me. Sorry? Yeah. So this circle, there's another one up here, it's very faint, and then just with the projector. Very, very important. I cannot stress the benefit and the significance of designating where your pin one goes. So, yeah, I, I can't even say more than that. Very, very important. If you have any device, especially if you have a, a thousand pin FPGA that is literally just a little square, just a little block, you can rotate it 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, or you would be absolutely screwed. Absolutely screwed. The minute you turn power on, you probably blow up your board. So you don't want to make that mistake. I want to stress it more than enough that you need to always, always designate whatever pin one. You need to have some reference in there for the manufacturer to be like, okay, yep, that was where pin one should be. They don't know. They also don't care. So it's very important that you cover your, you cover your grass. Very, very often. So. As I kind of touched on before, there's standards for everything in PCB design. Every single thing. Uh, it's actually ridiculously overwhelming, the number of standards. Uh, the standards come from a, kind of a, a governing body, or really it's just a group of manufacturers that got together in the 70s. They said, hey, we're making PCBs. We should all make them kind of the same. And then it expanded, and now, like everything, there's a ridiculous number of standards that exist for almost anything that you want to do for a PCB. It's great. And then it's not so great when you have to read through all that. But it's great because then you have naming conventions, for instance. So the previous example was an SOIC part. It was an 8-pin part, and it happened to have certain physical parameters about it that are very, very, very generic. So one chip from microchip, for instance, could be the same as a, the package from Texas Instruments, from NXP. So the idea is that you have a conventional naming, uh, a naming convention so that you don't keep recreating the same footprint. So that particular one, based on a naming convention from IPC, uh, was called an SOIC 127P. So that's the pitch between two pins. So that's the distance from center to center. It was 1.27 millimeters. Plus the lead, so the lead span is the distance between the one side to the other side. That happened to be six millimeters. And then that's times the height. So the height of this is 1.75 millimeters, and then there's eight pins to it. Very, very helpful, very, very convenient, very, very annoying to get familiar with, and you certainly don't have to stick to a naming convention. No one's gonna come and, and tell you, oh, you named that wrong, the manufacturer doesn't care. Uh, most people don't care. But when you get into industry, when you, get, when you start producing a variety of different boards, you're going to really want to stick to a convention so that you don't waste your time making that SYC 127 part over and over and over again every time you do a new design. It saves you a ton of time to have really, really good libraries. And that's kind of the benefit of using the freeware versions. So Eagle and PCAT, there's a lot of user libraries that they put online that people have for generic packages. So a generic package could be an 0402 resistor, an 0603 resistor, a surface mount package. Uh, it could be for the SOIC part. Uh, it's great. They're all there, they're all readily available, but you gotta use it at your own discretion. Check the, whatever package you take from online, check it, make sure it actually makes sense. Very easy for me to name it one thing and for it to actually be another. Um, but that is the benefit of having a, a free software and freeware and a, a big community space around it. So some of, other footprints that I have. 
Can anyone kind of guess what this footprint is? What type of footprint is it? I heard it from someone. Yeah, it's PGA. So this particular one, again, based on a naming convention, it's a BGA package, 144 pins, and then basically the dimensions of the, of the package. Very convenient. I don't have to make it again. I made it once, never have to make it again. What about this one? Can anyone guess what this package is? I hear a lot of whispering. Any guesses? Starts with the Q. It's a QFN package. That just means it's a little box. You've got the pins on the side. Um, so a little bit of pads just on the end of time. Here you can see the outline of the package. Very helpful to do in, in your software. Um, you can't see on this, but there's also a package outline. So when it comes time to doing the 3D mechanical review, uh, the mechanical designer doesn't care what this package looks like. They just want to know what's the shape, what's the height. So the only way to do that is to put that information in your PCB footprint files. So in, the, in your PCB footprint files, there's an outline here that defines the overall dimensions of it, as well as the height. So this particular one is a one millimeter package. And that will come up as a little box. You'll see it a little bit later. What about, oh, that came out horribly. All right, never mind. So this one just it happens to be a micro USB connector. Um, there's no naming convention for, for some items. They just are what they are. And again, it kind of goes to show that you don't have to do the naming convention. Uh, it's convenient to use, but it's really up to you. Name them whatever you want. You can name this box. You can name that bigger box. That's fine, as long as the software can reference those, those files. They don't care. So, as I mentioned earlier, going from the schematic to the PCB layer, you need a file that defines the connections. You need a file that, that links your schematic, so it needs to link, I don't know, device U1 to U2. It's connected from pin 1 to pin 2. So all that information is all contained within the netlist. <coughs> That's all it is, it's just a document highlighting what connects to where. So, uh, also as I mentioned earlier, you can add design constraints into it based on certain net names, based on certain net parameters. If I have uh, a power rail, for instance, and it's a 10 amp power rail, I'm not gonna wanna use a really tiny trace board. I'm not gonna wanna use a millimeter trace. That's just gonna break, it's gonna, it's gonna fail. You can't pass that much current, that much power, through a very, very small trace. You need, just like any other wire, you need to, to be mindful of that. So as long as you properly name them within your schematic, as long as you use net names, you could get away then with using your net list to define all these design constraints once you get to the PCB layout. It's a bit more involved, a bit more intense, very helpful when you have big designs. Uh, a design like this, for instance, uh, we had to define all, uh, define all the USB, all of the memory, all the high speed signals, uh, as well as the power rails too. So any questions so far? All good, moving okay, not too fast, not too slow. Sure. <laughs> From getting to PCB, the actual PCB channels. So to start, uh, the basic one is just a generic two layer PCB, has copper on the top, copper on the bottom, and some material, some mystery material in the middle. So this material can be a variety of different materials. Uh, you can call it the core, you can call it some insulating material, but typically it's FR4, just happens to be a fiberglass, reinforced with epoxy, that's all it is. Um, so this material is sandwiched between the middle. On the top and the bottom you have two sheets, they're just like tinfoil, but they're made of copper. So there are two sheets of copper laminated to the top and the bottom of whatever your insulation material is. So this typical and the kind of the standard thickness of a PCB is 1.6 millimeters. That just goes back from, that was what they could manufacture way back when and there's no reason to change. You can get a PCB in almost any thickness that you want, but just like anything, if you deviate from standards, you're gonna pay a lot of money. So, there are standard thicknesses readily available online and also readily available from your manufacturer. So when you go and you produce a PCB, you're gonna to wanna to definitely know your manufacturer before you start designing it because they're going to provide design constraints for you. 
If you wanted, for instance, a PCB that was two millimeters, for some reason, this board actually happens to be two millimeters thick. We had, that was a design constraint provided to us from our mechanical designers. What they didn't know is that that also costs an extra like $500 per board. It's ridiculous. They have to make that two millimeter core specifically for us. So it's, it became kind of ridiculous because we deviated from standards, but that's what happens in industries. Sometimes there's reason to, to deviate. In most cases, there's not. This happens to be uh, a board that actually doesn't have, so all these boards here, you see that they're green, some of them are red. Um, this, the green is just what they call solder mask. So solder mask is just like, uh, just a paint. I don't know any other kind of way to describe it. Um, all it's doing is covering up the copper that you do not want exposed to air and leaving the pads that you do want exposed to air. So if I intend on putting a component there, I want to leave that pad exposed so that I can solder to it. So this board actually is before the, uh, the board's actually been silk or that solder mask. Here you can also see a plated through hole via it. So in order to connect from top and the bottom, we need to drill a hole and then they plate it afterwards to maintain a connection. So they plate it with more copper. They kind of grow the copper inside of that hole so that you can ensure a connection between the top and the bottom. So uh, from a general perspective, uh, there are layers that you will always have to have. So there's the top silk screen, the bottom silk screen. Those are up to interpretation of whether you need them or not. Again, your choice, your design constraints. There's a top solder mask and a bottom solder mask. You can produce a board without solder mask. It's kind of not a good idea because then you could drop anything on it and you could short between anything. So the idea of the solder mask is really to provide some sort of insulation for the rest of your circuit. You only want to expose the contacts that you intend on using. The reason why you don't add solder mask is that you can produce a board very easily, very cheap. U of T in the design center, they have the ability to make a two layer PCB. They'll make it for you for free. Maybe they'll charge you for the plate. Doesn't matter, it's very cheap. You can also get a company in Alberta. If you submit the design files by 1 p.m. in the afternoon, they will ship it to you and you'll have it before noon the next day. A two layer board without solder mask. So there's some good advantages towards not having solder mask if you're in a pinch. You're prototyping something, um, but if you're going to go into production, you're going to want to put solder mask on. There's the top and the bottom copper. These are just the two layers at minimum. Um, I shouldn't say that. You can also have only a one layer board. You can have copper just on the top, no copper on the bottom. This particular board is exactly like that. So this board only costs $1.50 because they only put copper on the bottom. They didn't put anything on the bottom. Uh, uh, they only put copper on the top. They didn't put anything on the bottom. So when you get into high volume, really cheap boards, uh, and a toothbrush, and a remote, there's no reason to have two layers. If you kind of provide some design constraints, you can route everything on one layer, and you can get away with a really, really cheap board. There has to be at a minimum an insulation material, at least between the top and the, bottom, uh, top and the bottom copper, and then however many internal layers that you want to have. So there's there's, a, there's not really a big restriction on the amount of layers that you want to use. It just all comes down to cost. You can get boards that are up to 40 layers, I've seen. Manufacturers in Toronto and North York can produce PCBs with layers up to 30 layers, uh, PCBs up to 30 layers thick. Um, it becomes a bit ridiculous. If you're fanning out, if you're, if you're trying to break out uh, all the pins on a thousand pin component, well, you can't really go out, you kind of have to go down. So in that case, you're going to need a multi-layer board. But if you only have uh, a couple of these components that, are, that have fairly big leads, fairly easy to fan out, uh, then there's absolutely no reason to go anything more than two or four layers. So when you do go to multi-layer boards, you're going to start to use uh, different types of VAs. So VIA structures and VIA fan out and all that type of stuff is very, very, very involved. Um, this particular board, in order to save cost, we wanted to make this in eight layers. We started out with having to use it in 10 layers. We had to use 10 layers. The, per board, that had an extra three bucks. So we spent a week 
a week trying to fan out uh, a 600 pin device in order to only use eight layers. So in the end, we were able to do it, but all that engineering time had to be invested in. So there's trade-offs, trade-offs to everything. Once you get into multi-layer boards, you're going to start to use not just through volt vias. So a three volt via connects from the top to the bottom layer at a minimum, and then it connects internal layers as well. You can make sure that a through hole via does not connect to internal layers if you want. That could be something that's very, very helpful. Or you can make sure that it does connect to internal layers. The other things, uh, the, uh, the other ones are also uh, blind vias, which are only exposed from an external layer into an internal layer. You, it doesn't go all the way through, it just stops. Then there's the buried vias. So these are vias that are not exposed to, to the top and bottom layer. They're only used internal layers. Can anyone guess how they manufacture a multi-layer board? Yeah. So they actually do a two layers by, uh, by each. So they make a two layer board, and they make, then they make another two layer board, another two layer board, and they keep uh, sandwiching them on. So, uh, it's interesting from a manufacturing perspective because the more layers you ask for, it basically adds another bit. So every two layers adds another bit. Just takes that time to, to laminate, to, to bond, to stick the boards together, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it just takes a day. So uh, when we produced an eight layer board, fastest you could get it in two weeks. When I produced a 18 layer board, fastest we could get it was in a month. That's just a design constraint. The core materials also, there are a variety of different core materials that you can get. Um, FR4, as I mentioned, just the fiberglass, the reinforced uh, with resin. That's your generic, everyday, cheap stuff. You can get really expensive materials if you're going to do really high speed signals. If you want to do something like 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, you can get material that has different insulation properties that provide better signal integrity characteristics. So there is a lot of design related work to picking out which core material that you want to use. But if you're just doing a generic PCB, toggling on some LEDs, some switches, a motor, you don't need anything complicated, pick the cheapest material you can get. So some of these are uh, alternative materials. Uh, this one here is actually really cool. They actually put a flex material in between. So it's actually a capped on sheet. I don't know if you've ever seen capped on sheets. Um, also, all you might is the technical name for it. But capped on is a company company name brand. Um, these are sheets that are that can sustain very, very high temperature. They can sustain temperatures up to, I think, 800 degrees Celsius. And you can stick on top of it just your copper foil. So now I can stick my copper foil onto it, sandwich two polyamide sheets around it, and then I can flex that board. So this particular board, you can actually fold. So this board, this one actually folds in first, then this one folds in again. So the benefit of that is that my area is only this size. I don't have to worry about having a, an L-shaped board or anything kind of weird. I can now stack it in a variety of different geometries. I just have a question about the, the, the insulator material. Mm -hmm. Can you, is it possible to order it so that you can locally change the material in only some areas? Yes. Um, a lot of manufacturers do not do that um, because, like I said, they, they do layer by layer. Um, it's very expensive. The, uh, the alternative is that you, you put the layer down and then you, you cut away. You machine it away, you etch it away, chemically etch it. Um, there are a variety of different options and kind of cheaper ways to do it than just only assembling it locally. So that's the alternative. So like when they want to make capacitors on the PCB, but you want like a higher, you want a higher dielectric constant. Mm -hmm. So do they do they do that, or do they just use the regular PCB material? Uh, in that particular case, if you want to have embedded caps, the yeah. whole PCB has to be that material. You can change uh, the dielectric. So the dielectric, the insulation material, it's got to be all the way across. So you can machine out areas and pockets. And that's how they do it for capacitors, uh, in order to have a localized 10 microfarads, one microfarads. Um, so what, what he's mentioning is the idea of actually embedding components inside of your PCB. So inside of your, um, your stack up here, there could be a design where there's certain material properties create a capacitance. So you can have a localized capacitor in that area. You can do that with resistors. Uh, some success has been done doing that with inductors. Not a lot, but um, that's the idea. You have two plates 
at a certain distance apart, dielectric material between them, just like any other capacitor, it works. They're very expensive, very cumbersome, and you need a large amount of area to do. So uh, we looked into doing them, it's not very worth it. Depends on your design. So. Yep. The uh, cap is usually, so is that the sort of thing you'd see, like, I don't know, feel like maybe like in a monitor or like a, a cap or something, that bendable thing that's always, always, almost, almost always a cap on sheet? Yep, okay. definitely. Um, so what's in my laptop, what's connecting the bottom to the, the LCD, there's a cap on sheet in there. Uh, they can sustain very, very, very good flexibility, very repetitive. Um, you can't fold them, you can't have a crease, but you can easily bend them back and forth for multiple different cycles. Yeah. Uh, for high speed, well, very high speed applications, will the PCB fall? Um, just like the layering and the connection in between become like a resonance cavity? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So there, uh, there exists software that is phenomenally good at determining that. So when you get into high speed uh, signal design, uh, yeah, it becomes a bit of a black art. Um, if you are doing something with a 10 gigahertz signal, even if you're doing uh, DDR memory, uh, and it's only at 800 megahertz, if you do that across uh, an address space of, you have 16 different traces, all routing one, or routing one path from one device to another, all at 800 megahertz, yeah, you have a huge amount of high speed, huge amount of uh, crosstalk between channels. The design constraints become incredible. Um, a company called uh, Metro Graphics produces software called Hyperlinks. It is very, very, very good software. Very, very expensive. I think the software license is like $20,000. If you're producing anything high speed, you have to buy a license because you'll produce boards and they just won't work. So, uh, at a previous place that I used to work, we thought DDR3 was going to be easy to route. Uh, we tried to route it without using any uh, high-speed tools. We turned on the board, could never access the memory. Not once. Couldn't use it. So the board was completely scrapped. Then we bought the license, and we realized that even just going from a top layer to a bottom layer, this via, if my signal went from the top to an internal layer, and I continued on, this little useless piece of copper cause a huge amount of resonance. So a huge, huge, huge issue with that signal integrity. So we actually had to back row. So that's something that, that, that can be done with through hole VAs, is that you back row them. So you plate the whole thing, you put the PC back in the picture, and then you drill it down to where you think that layer is to remove that copper. That's a very expensive process, but sometimes you need to do it. So, another alternative for uh, PCB materials, very recent, uh, is uh, metal core PCBs. Uh, they become, they're, they're really kind of cool. They, uh, they laminate the copper foil onto a very, very, very thin dielectric and then directly onto metal. So the idea here is, in some cases, you, actually, you can actually bond the top copper directly to the metal uh, for heat transfer. So it's become very popular, uh, popular in uh, LED design. So almost every LED board, every high power LED, anything that's in a car, uh, anything that's in uh, a household LED lamp, almost guaranteed it's on a metal pad, a metal core PCB. Uh, LEDs, especially for cars or for lights, produce a huge amount of heat. Uh, they are radiating from a very small area to produce a huge amount of light. All of it, a lot of it just goes wasted into thermal energy. So you gotta dissipate that somehow. Regular uh, FR4 material is really bad at transferring heat. Really bad. It's an insulator. So just like how it's insulating you from an electrical connection, it's also insulating thermally. So that's where the creation of the metal core PCBs came into, uh, kind of into the whole manufacturing process in the last couple of years. It really taken off. So as I mentioned before, uh, there are a lot. Yeah? Sorry, uh, just about the metal core. So uh, but that's the one thing I never understood is uh, because they're thermally inductive, mm -hmm. like how do they not allow the electrical conductivity to be called? Like even the like these as we said they're exactly the copper directly on the, mm -hmm. the metal, how is that not an issue? Mm -hmm. So in this particular board, uh, this one is a is there's an LED in the center, and you can see how uh, there's these drilled holes here. So this particular board has the copper foil, so there's, there's solder mask on top of it, that's the white, and they have the copper foil, and then underneath it they have a really, really thin piece of dielectric material. Um, and so 
that's doing the insulation from the electrical connection. Uh, it's very thin, typically in boards, it's usually like a millimeter thick to get that 1.6 millimeter thickness. Uh, in most of these cases, it's only a couple millimeter, uh, 0 0.0 some odd millimeters. Very, very thin. Uh, you're only doing electrical insulation at that point. Um, they drill these holes here so that they do get the direct connection from the LED package directly to the metal. So these are drilled and then plated. This whole board is then plated again. So the manufacturing process is kind of neat. So uh, yeah, as I mentioned, there's standards that exist for everything. Um, in this day and age, standards have become ridiculous. But uh, for PCB manufacturing, it's absolutely no different. This is IPC's standard map of all of the standards that exist for PCB design. So uh, this is ridiculous, scary, almost useless. Uh, from a designer standpoint, you only need to know a few. Uh, from a manufacturer standpoint, you only need to know a few. So there's basically a whole bunch of standards for the whole process of designing a PCB, to manufacturing the PCB, to maintaining the PCB, and then to even scrapping the board. So one of these standards at the end has something to do with how do you dispose of a PCB. Um, that's just what standards bodies do. IPC is the governing body for, for PCB design. It's the one that you guys would be interested in and from a kind of a PCB design perspective. IPC 2221 is a very generic, very helpful standard. Um, the reality is though, just look at the PCB manufacturer that you're going to use. The standards are very helpful. They, they, help, they help you uh, understand why the design constraints exist. So the PCB manufacturers didn't make these up on a whim. They are based off of something. What they're based off of is all those IPC standards, but you can go directly to a manufacturer's website and you can see all of the standards that, that will really apply to you. So a couple uh, kind of very easy to use manufacturers. Osh Park is pretty cool. It's a community-based one. Uh, they, uh, the whole process is that you submit a PCB. They amalgamate it into a much bigger design file. So when you produce a board, you end up producing a panel. So this particular panel has 48 boards on it, 48 of the exact same boards. So the reason why they do that is because that's how they always produce a PCB. They will start with a panel of a certain size, certain dimension, and then they will make your board. If I ordered only one of these boards, well, they would have still given me, the, given me this whole panel, but they would only have one board on it. The problem with that is that you pay for that whole panel. Every single time that you design a PCB and then you go and you manufacture it, you pay for that whole panel. What Off Park has done that's interesting is they're community based. So every Tuesday or every Monday, I think almost now they do it every other day, they submit an order to a manufacturer that has all sorts of people's designs on one single panel. So the idea is that you're sharing the one time engineering cost to produce a board, you're sharing that amongst a bunch of different people, all sharing a single panel. And then afterwards, the guy receives them, snaps them off, breaks them off, ships them to you, you get a cheap board. It takes a long time, it takes a couple weeks, uh, but they're very, very, very cheap. Crimp circuits, they're located in North York, they're pretty decent. Um, they just happen to be another PCB manufacturer that's out there. Uh, there's a lot that are actually in the Toronto region. Um, a lot of them are in kind of North York area. AP circuits is Alberta printed circuits. They are fantastic in terms of quick turnaround time. Uh, like I mentioned before, if I wanted to do a PCB without any solder mask, I can get it. If I submitted it uh, by 1 o'clock, I'll get it the next day by noon. So that's a pretty fantastic service. Um, the other thing is that you can submit it all online. It's all automated. It's very easy to use. But with it, on all of these manufacturers' websites, they will always specify what their minimum design requirements are. So they'll typically uh, provide a list. Uh, so tra uh, trace width is a big one. So that is the width of this trace. So if I want to make a trace that is 0 0.0001 millimeter wide, uh, that's just ridiculous and practical, not possible. They will provide the minimum trace width that they can reliably manufacture. Trace spacing is also pretty critical. So the space between one trace to another, that'll be a requirement that they provide. The minimum hole diameter as well. So this is how small of a hole they can actually drill in your board. Uh, if you ever want to drill a very small hole, they actually don't use physical drills, they use lasers. That gets very, very expensive very quickly, but that's how you can produce smaller holes. Most of these manufacturers here, 
They're very, very uh, kind of one-off manufacturers. They're not high volume, they're just there for prototyping. Uh, they won't do small holes. Uh, eight millimeter, eight mil drill hole, that's eight thou, point zero zero eight inches. Very small hole, but you can get half that size of your laser drill. So um, just the, the different standards from different manufacturers. Uh, they'll also provide you with a minimum angular resonance. So this is the amount of copper that is around that hole. So if I had an 8 millimeter, 8 mil drill hole, and I only had a 10 mil pad, that means that this here is only 1 mil. They cannot guarantee a hole location accuracy that good. So the manufacturer will have tolerances to where this hole can be placed. So what you actually might get, and what you do get when you look at the board, is that this drilled hole will actually be drilled here. So you'll see that uh, the, the hole is not centered to your pad. So they provide a minimum annular ring so that they guarantee a, a, an electrical connection from that drilled hole to whatever trace that it's going off to. <coughs> Most CAD software provide at least generic constraints. So uh, Oshpark, Crimp Circuits, Alberta Printed Circuits, they all have almost the exact same constraints. They all have pretty much these constraints. And that's it, that's all you need. Everything else that you can do then all becomes design constraints. So from a manufacturing standpoint, they don't care what you do, how you do it. They don't care what your trace widths are with respect to high power traces. Um, if you're running 200 and, uh, 220 volts AC, you have to have a certain gap between that trace and another trace. If the traces are too closely placed, you will get an uh, arc between the two traces. That is something that they don't care about. Manufacturers will not question it. But they will produce the board and they will say, have fun. So design constraints are very, very important from the engineering perspective that you don't screw up on your board. Typical design constraints include, like I mentioned, power trace widths. Uh, also creepage, which is the distance between a certain trace to another trace. Um, component keep out regions. You can't place components on top of each other. Uh, you'll see later on there's kind of package keep outs. Um, connector locations, those could be just driven strictly from a mechanical standpoint if you want to mate to another connector. Obviously that connector has to be properly placed. Um, high speed signals, USB, DDR, HDMI, all sorts of stuff. Um, test probe location, grounds, whether you have two grounds for analog and digital. There's all sorts of design constraints and they will all depend entirely on your design. The manufacturer and the PCB software will never question what you do. As long as you meet the manufacturing minimums, you can produce anything that you want. So you got to be very conscious of your design constraints. Any questions? I have a question. Hmm? So in the in the the software, the design software, can you do, are there like files that you can import from different manufacturers, like the design rule checks? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what they are. They produce uh, design rule checks. So at the end of every design that you want to you want to kind of click that, they call yeah. the DRC button. And then it'll go through and it'll make sure that your minimum trace widths, your trace spacing, all those things are met. So all of these uh, manufacturers provide those files? No. Um, no. Oshpark doesn't. Um, I know Alberta Print Circus doesn't. Uh, Crim Circus also definitely doesn't. None of them do. Um, only really much bigger manufacturers, uh, higher volume guys will do that. Um, honestly, the, the CAD packages will always start with the basic. So they'll start with the IPC standard basic design requirements. So uh, what was pictured previously, uh, kind of that eight mil drill hole, 18 millimeter in the membrane, all those things are IPC standards. Those are the minimums that are typical. So better manufacturers can do better with better technology, laser drill holes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but usually the CAD software will start you in a good place. So as a, as a bit of a design constraint example, um, Let's talk about high current traces. So if I have a 12 volt rail at four amps, uh, what is a PCB trace width that I need? So again, IPC standards exist that you can calculate your minimum trace width to ensure a certain temperature rise on that trace and to ensure that you can actually tolerate that much power along that trace. So if I wanted to make a one millimeter trace to carry four amps, well, it, would, it wouldn't work. So this is a, a calculator that's available, readily available online. First thing that you Google, it's the first one that comes up. In here, you can put in your, your current. So I have four amps. 
I have a, a thickness of my trace, one ounce copper. That defines the, the geometry of the trace. The temperature rise that I'm allowing, so I only want 10 degrees temperature change from ambient, which even in and of itself is kind of getting to be a high number. Uh, you can certainly design your, your boards to have much higher temperature changes if that's what your design constraints allow. Um, it's not a very good idea though. If you produce a board and if you have a temperature rise of 60 degrees, you're going to go from 25 ambient, assuming that you're just inside, now to your board at 4 amps being at 85 degrees C. So your board and most of the components, they'll tolerate it, but then when you go to touch the board, it's going to really, really hurt. So it's a really bad idea. The other thing too, is that most boards do not operate at room temp. So an Arduino Uno, sure, that's not going to space, that's not going into a high temp environment, that's just going to be sitting in a lab somewhere or in a room, whatever. But if you are producing a board that's going on an airplane, that's going to be sitting on a tarmac that is contained in a black box, it's going to get hot fast. If there's no air in that box, it's going to get even hotter, even faster. This particular board was going to go on an airplane, it's going to go on a camera turret, on the bottom side of an airplane, in a black box with no circulating air. This particular board, we could not tolerate a temp rise on a trace higher than 5 degrees. This board was tested up to 85 degrees in a thermal chamber. Um, the design constraints that we applied, uh, that, we, that we used, uh, make sure that we met only 90 degrees C on the board when we did temperature testing. It's very critical. That's a very, very, very expensive component and an even more expensive component attached to an airplane. And so you do not want it to fail. You don't, you don't want to be the guy who sells you something, you go on a tarmac and it fails. That just so happens to be a regular occurrence for something that's going on an airplane, it's going to be in a black box, no circulating air, it's going to get hot. There's a design constraint you got to be aware of. So in this particular case, if I want 4 amps at 1 ounce copper thickness, 10 degrees temperature rise, for my internal layers, it's 5.29, but for my external layers, it's 2.03 millimeters. Can anybody guess why? Why does my trace inside my board have to be bigger than my trace outside my board? So the temperature can be spread out. Nope, uh, not necessarily. So I mean, this, this is just telling you that if it's an internal layer, it's got to be bigger than an external layer. Yep. Yeah. Thermal considerations. Yeah. So the, the ability to just transfer. So when you're sandwiched between two insulating materials, you're not really transferring much heat. The idea of the, the, the FR4 material. But when you're uh, a copper layer on the top or the bottom, you do have air right next to it. So that air could be circulating, there could be some movement of the air, or it could be stationary. It doesn't really matter. There's still that ability to transfer heat away from the board. So that's why it's very important to know where the trace is actually going to be located. If the, low, if the trace is going to be inside of a, uh, in, in, uh, in one of the interior layers, well, then you've got to make it a lot wider. So it's something that you've got to be considerate of. So just as a, as a kind of matter of fact, most signal traces are 0.25 millimeters. If I stuck with my current of 4 amps at a 1 ounce copper thickness, at 0.25 millimeters, that trace has to be, added. that trace will have a huge, huge temperature rise. I think it was like 100 degrees C, away from ambient. So if I made my trace 0.25 millimeters, 4 amps, then my trace is already just based on simple design constraints, it's already going to be over 100 degrees C. That's not very practical, so you got to be very aware of these things. So component placing. After uh, component placing, after you import your netlist, you're going to want to start placing your components in a very logical, very meaningful kind of orientation and way. You don't want to place a filter capacitor extremely far away from the device that you're trying to filter. You don't want to uh, place your power components really far away from the IC that's doing the switching for your power beds. You want to keep things logically placed, very convenient, very, very organized. Um, at this point also you should be importing any constraints that you have from the mechanical designer, like the board outline. This particular board, I was provided a board outline that was 20 millimeters wide, and that's it. That's all I had to work with. So that constraint right there can tell me how many layers I'm going to need and how, where I can place the components. 
Keep out regions are also very common. Even if you had a mounting hole, even if you had a locating pin in, in, on your PCB, there's all sorts of regions to have uh, component keep out areas. So those are just areas where you cannot place a component. Maybe you cannot place a component taller than one millimeter. Maybe you cannot place any high speed components in there. Maybe there's a uh, radiating uh, EMI source right above it. There's all sorts of reasons why you have different de design constraints. Again, logically place your components. After you've placed them, you'll kind of come up with this file. This file will provide all of your 3D information for all the components. Again, this is with this board. So this board here, I can see in 3D where my components are placed, what the package heights are, and what the outlines are. Very convenient. I can send this to a mechanical designer. They can tell me, nope, that connector is not located properly. In this case, there's a connector right here. Maybe that was located a couple millimeters where it should have been. Very convenient, very helpful. Um, you go kind of go back and forth between the mechanical designer and then yourself. The goal here is to not do any PCB layout, not to connect a single pin to another pin before you've confirmed mechanical layout. Um, you can, you can place it all, hope for the best, wrote everything, and then they can come back to you and say, we need to move all of this all over the place. Very, very, very inconvenient. So try to be, uh, work very closely with any mechanical designers that you end up working with. If you're making a generic board, no mechanical constraints, that's fine too, it's all up to you. Uh, if you're placing it into a generic box, sure, then just make sure that your component heights will fit in that box. Make sure your mounting holes are correctly located. Just those set of simple things. Something to be aware of. So after you get a confirmation from mechan mechanical designers, uh, after you know everything's placed properly, then it's only worthwhile to start routing. So here you can see, there's a, these are the components placed, and you can see all these lines, these lines that are crisscrossing, intersecting. These are the nets. These are the nets that are defined from the schematic to the PCB layer. The nets, when it first imports into your, into your PCB design software, go the shortest possible distance between a pin and whatever other pin it connects to. So if I had a ground, which is common across the whole board, if I had a ground on this pin, and then there was another ground on this pin, it would connect directly, take the shortest possible path. That's not to say, though, that this pin isn't ground as well. So you have to be very aware when you place components that some of the nets, some of these lines, are a bit tricky. Grounds are located almost everywhere in your, uh, in your uh, PCB layout. Almost all ICs have a ground. If they don't, it's kind of a weird IC. There's going to be a lot of them. So the shortest path, the, the line that comes up here, might not be the best path that you want to follow. So that's to say that when you do the PCB layout, that little blue net line really doesn't mean much. It shows you where it's going to go. It shows you where your net has to go. But it does not in any way, shape, constrain you from routing it in a particular way. So it's really up to you as a designer. Route it any way that makes sense. A good kind of uh, rule of thumb is to start with really important signals, any high speed stuff, if you have USB, DDR, all that stuff, all the really difficult stuff to route, HDMI, anything like that, start with the difficult stuff. Uh, you don't want to spend weeks doing the rest of the board, get to the difficult stuff, and realize you can't do it. It's really not a good way to go. Um, at this point, you've got all the difficult stuff routed, and you can do power. Usually it's pretty convenient, but in a case where you have a 100 pin device, you might have four or five different power rails on it. If you have four or five different power rails, well then you want to logically place your power nets. You don't want them to be kind of coming in at every different angle. So it takes a bit of design work, a bit of effort. Only after that, then you can do the rest. All the kind of the unimportant signals. A generic digital input, something simple, something that's taller than a switch. Those can be kind of routed any other way. Any way that you can get it routed. So silkscreen, if you're going to do silkscreen, Make sure that it's not useless. Make sure that it's very informative, it's very helpful. If you produce a board that has silk screen that's underneath devices, well, it's not very useful. So this particular device is my uh, controller. So when I place it, this is all black. If I put my U5 designation underneath this, ah, that's not really useful. Right? It's great when I have just a bare board. I can still read it. But when I go and I place that part, well, now that silk screen's covered. So it's not useful at all. So try to keep things out of uh, component keyboard areas. Try to make sure that you can read them. 
be very, very mindful of that. Other things to think of is, is any helpful information you can put on. So connectors, uh, they should probably be a, a bigger silkscreen text. If you're putting a connector down, that's something that you're, you or someone else is going to be connecting to. That's something that someone will want to be, uh, want to be able to read quickly, and maybe they need to read it often. Um, so you want to make that text very big, very apparent, very easy to find. Uh, in, in, a, in a PCB that we did that had, uh, I think it was over 30 connectors, each one was horrendously placed. Uh, we had silk screen kind of tucked away uh, at weird spots next to components. Uh, J1 would be somewhere. The connector would be a little further off because that's just the only way that we could locate it. Uh, it was a very densely packed board. And we tried to keep all the silk screen on it, and we tried to keep every device labeled. Well, when you go to manufacturing floor, uh, the, the individual who's connecting the connector doesn't care what C12 is, they don't care what U5 is. All that's useless information. So be very mindful when you're doing silk screen. If you're doing it for, if you have 30 connectors, maybe that's the only thing you want to have on your silk screen. Maybe you also want to put some text beside the connector so that it describes the functionality of it. Maybe J2 is a power connector. Maybe you want to say power, maybe you want to say pin 1 is 12 volts, pin 2 is ground. All of this is information you can put on the board, and as much as you can, do that so that it's very simple to use. At the end of the day, either you or someone else is going to be using the board, but that's going to be their main source of reference. Uh, in a case where you have a really, really highly densely packed board, like the Apple iPad 2 board, uh, they probably have just another document that prints out all the, the locations of each, uh, each device. That's something that only a handful of people need to know. The handful of people probably know where to find that file, so it's not really useful to put the silk screen on it. So just be aware, be mindful, make it useful. And always put a pin one mark on it. <laughs> always put a pin one mark. After you've done the writing, the silk screen, all of, your, all of your files are ready to go, you're ready to do, then do the manufacturing files. Manufacturing files change a bit uh, depending on the manufacturer. They'll want different file names, they'll want different file types. All of that is handled within the design software. Um, the different types you can output from almost all of the design software. You can output a variety of different types. The manufacturer is the one who's going to tell you which type they want. So this particular set of files uh, comes from Osh Park. So they tell you every type of uh, file that they want to see, and they tell you what, what it should be named. Makes it very easy when you submit a zip file with all these files in, well then they're going to check it, they're going to use some automation tool. As long as all those names exist, as long as all those files are there, they're going to go ahead and print your board. If those files don't exist, they're going to come back to you, they're going to email you, they're going to say, hey, where's your files? You're not going to get them the files for another day or two, blah, blah, blah. Waste of time. So be very mindful of what the manufacturer wants, be very aware of the file types that they want to use, and, pretty, and generate those manufacturing files. Uh, it's all readily available in the design software that you pick. It'll have explanations of how to generate these files. In some cases, like Eagle, there are tons of online tutorials showing you how to generate PCB files. So it's uh, very, very simple to do. When you produce those manufacturing files, oh, this came out horribly. When you produce those manufacturing files, those are the files that they will actually use to make your board. Your design software, for some reason, might show you something different. So it is very possible, and it is very common, for there to be mistakes between your design files and the manufacturing files that you produced. When you produce a manufacturing file, maybe you forgot to add, include one of the silkscreen layers that you wanted to print. So what happens then when you submit it to the manufacturer is that they'll see a silkscreen file is there, but one of the layers is missing. They don't care. They don't know what you wanted to print. They'll just think that those files are exactly what you wanted to make, and they'll make it. The benefit here is that you can, in between, before sending them to the, uh, to the manufacturer, you can look with a, uh, a free viewer. Viewmate is by far the best viewer that's available. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite easy to use. You can import the Gerber files that you generated. So these are the manufacturing files that you generated. And you can at least do just a sanity check. You don't have to connect that your copper connects from this pin to this pin. You could do that, very, very detailed, but really you want to just do a sanity check. You want to make sure that this is your top copper layer, this looks like what you have in your design file. Because maybe this is labeled wrong. Maybe your top copper is actually your bottom copper. 
Who knows? There's all sorts of errors that could exist. It's very, 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 very recommended to look at the manufacturing files that you produce. Those are what the vendors can make for you, the, the manufacturer. So it takes a bit of time, maybe 10, 20 minutes. It's very worth it. So there are lots and lots of standards that exist. There's tons of information on PCB design. There is tons of resources available if you just Google it. Lots of free software exists, lots of examples. And there are lots of standards, but don't let it scare you. Uh, the best way to learn about PCB design is just to make a PCB yourself. You're going to make a PCB, it's probably not going to work the first time, maybe it doesn't work that well. You'll figure out why it didn't work that well. You'll move on. You'll understand why, and then you'll make, make a, another PCB that's better. Really, you've got to start making boards. They're very cheap, very low cost to make. Um, if you have the time, if you have the patience. And that's the best way that you can learn. U of T offers quite a bit of services uh, with respect to PCB design that people don't take advantage of. Uh, like I mentioned before, there is uh, free licenses of Eagle available that are the complete licenses. Uh, and then there is also PCB manufacturing services for two layer boards. Uh, they can do it in the design center. Uh, I don't know if they charge you, probably not. Probably not, if not, it would just be the, the copper layer that you have to pay for, but that would be pretty cheap. So the, the tools and the services are, are there, readily available to you at U of T. So take advantage of them, make a PCB, see if it works, move on. So that's it. Comments? So uh, this whole presentation was about transferring schematics to PCB layouts. Is there any software existing that does the opposite from a PCB layout drawing reverse engineer into a schematic? Not really. Um, in the very expensive softwares like Cadence, uh, Orcad, or Altium, uh, they can do uh, backwards uh, export of a netlist but you have to have the design file. So you can't do it from a Gerber. So a Gerber is, is literally just artwork. It's just like, this is what I want to print, and that's it. So, uh, yeah, not from, not from manufacturer's files, you can't go backwards, but uh, from a design file, you could go backwards. Yeah? So, like, so what, uh, like, what have you done with, like, so I know you described these, these things, right, but like, what have you done with these even like, even like, uh, undergrad, uh, I, I was I was mainly involved with the, the FSA team. Um, they build uh, the race car that, uh, that's on campus. Uh, I did uh, PCB design for a lot of sensors. I did a data acquisition unit, and when I graduated, I continued doing PCB design. I did a tablet, charging dock, uh, aerospace stuff, uh, a variety of different boards. So uh, yeah, I've been in the industry for, for a little while. Now. Yeah. Uh, almost always it's recommended to use a ground plane. Ground planes are great. Uh, if you can use a, a, a four layer board and just the internal layers are just your, your power and your ground planes, that's great. That's, that's a, a great way to do it. Um, if not, if you're going to use a two layer board, you can connect them kind of like a daisy chain and stuff, but you just have to be uh, aware of your return currents. So it's something that when you get into it, you'll start to realize that you, you see added noise, especially from switch mode stuff. If you don't have the ability to sync that into a ground plane and then have capacity filtering elsewhere, uh, you'll notice that as you start to daisy chain your grounds so of just one net, one, one trace, you'll start to see a lot of noise. So it's a trade off. It depends on how many components complexity the piece of the